My name's Eleanor Sunchild. I'm from Thunderchild First Nation in Saskatchewan. Being in this room brings back a lot of memories because I, I did my, my university years here at, at U of A and I worked at Treaty 6, the Confederacy. That's actually where I met my husband, Anthony, who's here with me today. But when I worked at the Confederacy, we used to have lots of events here. And it's, um, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Don't want to don't want to age myself, but that was quite a while ago. But it, it's um it's great to be back here. I don't think I know anyone. I haven't seen anyone that I know. But maybe if 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 you know me, come say hi after. <coughs> U of A was very hard law school to go to. Um, at the time. I mean, the Prairie Provinces have not always been welcoming to to students or Indigenous people who who um, enter their spaces. And the U of A at that time was no different. It was it's Alberta. I don't think it's changed a lot. Uh, I read the Sovereignty Act. It it's just another piece of colonial legislation that's trying to ignore us, wipe us out, uh, forget that we're here, but you know what, we're still here. So these things are always gonna come up, these pieces of legislation, it's systemic racism, or it's just racism. And um, you know, it's all, like, like Jesse said, it's one thing after another, always. And I hope one day that it, it stops, but we have to keep we have to keep stepping up. We have to keep pointing out who we are because our kids are coming, our grandchildren are coming. And I'm very honored to be a speaker here. I look at the list of speakers. Um, Sharon Venn was one of, one of my um, role models at law school. She, she used to come and mentor us there. I've known Sharon for a long time. And the list of speakers that that you got for this event is phenomenal, and I'm very proud to be here. So she'll be my clicker. This is, I, I'm, I talk about Colton because I don't want people in this country, I don't want the colonial systems to ever forget the name Colton Bushy. Ever. So I call this, this PowerPoint Act of, Acts of War, Colonial Realities of Prairie Life. Like I said, it's always one thing after another in this country, but especially here in the prairies, because the racism, they're just so blatant with it. They just don't care. They don't want to learn their history. They don't want to learn anything about indigenous people. They just want to keep taking over everything. And we're pushing back. We've, we've always been pushing back. Colton Bushy, this is a picture of Colton. So I just want to give some background on how I got involved in this, in this case. Colton's uncle, Alvin Baptiste, who you've seen in the media, he's the one with the fan, with the eagle fan. He, um, he's married into my community in Thunderchild. And Thunderchild and Red Pheasant, where Alvin is from, it's all the same area in Treaty 6, it's, six, it's by Battleford. So I know Alvin through that connection, and that is Colton's uncle. Colton's mom is Debbie Baptiste. I talk about her a lot in this PowerPoint. Colton and, uh, sorry, Debbie and Alvin are brother and sister. So when this happened on August 9th, he was shot at Bigger by, by Gerald Stanley, a white farmer. And the next day, J August 10th, Alvin called me and he said, my nephew was shot at this, at this white man's house, at his farm. 
and they said that he was stealing. He wasn't stealing. He went there because he had a flat tire. And, and I said, what? And then he explained it. He said, yeah, he was with his friends, and they went to this farm to get help, and, and he got shot. And I, and I said, well, you know what? We have to go to the media with this. So that's how, that's how I got involved. That next day, the next day there was a press release issued. I'll, I'll get to that, but that's when it started. So in the afternoon of August 9th, 2016, five young Indigenous people pulled up to Gerald Stanley's farm after an afternoon of swing. And there's a movie. Has anyone in this room seen the movie? It's called We Will Stand Up. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. It's on the National Film Board website. I think it's also on CBC Gem. And Tasha Hubbard made the film. Tasha just started um, following, following the family one day with, with camera. And she wanted to film it because she knew that what was happening was very significant. And she wasn't sure what was going to happen in the trial or what she was going to do with the footage. But it all ended up being made into a movie. And the movie actually uh, was premiered at TIFF in Toronto at the International Film Festival where it won like the top movie and it won awards. It went all over the world, that movie. We presented it um, in Parliament. They presented it in Parliament. Like it every, It's been everywhere. And then COVID hit. It was just picking up and then COVID hit. So we were planning on going to Australia, uh, sorry, New Zealand, um, the United Nations with the movie and it, and it then COVID hit. But if you have the opportunity to watch the movie, watch it. It's a very, it's a hard watch. It really is. But uh, it tells the story of Colton, of his family, of the racism that we, that we all experience as Indigenous people in Canada, but especially uh, the background in the Battlefords um, where the eight indigenous warriors were hung and the rebellion it wasn't a rebellion they were being starved but it goes into all that history it tells it tells um, the story of this family and their fight for justice and this is just one one family there are so many people who faced racism and injustice systemic racism in our legal system and um, <clears throat> but I, I like to talk about Colton, like I said, because he he really, he didn't deserve to die. And he didn't deserve to be slandered in the media, in social media. Uh, he wasn't a thief. And he deserved justice. So, as I said, they were, they were swimming. And then they pulled up into Gerald Stanley's yard. Um, in the front of the vehicle, there were two indigenous males named Cassidy, Cassidy and uh, Eric. And in the back, there were there was Colton and two girls named uh, just his two friends in the back. And one of the males in the front, when they pulled in there, he he got out of the vehicle and he jumped on a quad that was sitting there. That that was what he did. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't the most terrible thing that they had been drinking. He jumped on this quad. And then at that point, Gerald Stanley and his son came running up. They were, they were down a hill working on a fence. And that w became a really uh, pivotal part of the trial because they said, oh, you know, it was hardworking Gerald Stanley and his son. They were down the hill and they were like working out in the hot sun. And then these, these Indians rolled up and they started messing with his stuff. So, so they had no choice but to come. And, and that was the narrative. That was the narrative right from the day he was shot. And it played out. It played out. It still plays out. People still love Gerald Stanley. They still applaud him. They still, you know, show their love for him on TikTok. It's sickening. But that that's the reality of where we live. Anyway, so Gerald Stanley and his son come running up to the the vehicle and his they kick they go to kick the taillight and then his son goes and smashes the windshield with hammer. And then uh 
the two in the front, the, the one who jumped off the quad, he jumps back in the vehicle and then they, they take off because they know they're under attack, so they take off. But because the windshield is smashed, they, they couldn't see. And so they drive into uh, his wife's vehicle, Gerald Stanley's wife's vehicle, it's parked there. And that's how, the, uh, that's how come they couldn't leave. So at that point, then the two in the front take off and Colton was like, he was sleeping in the back seat with these two girls. He wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he didn't know what was going on. Some point he woke up, then he jumps in the front seat because, uh, because uh, Gerald Stanley had ran to his shed and grabbed his gun. And he's, those two in the front ran to the field and then Gerald Stanley shot they called them warning shots in the trial, but I don't think they were warning shots because the one witness testified that those bullets went whizzing by his head. To me, that doesn't that doesn't speak of warning shots. Anyway, so the 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 gun started the the gun started uh, firing. The bullets started flying. At some point, Colton jumps in the front seat of the SUV, and then he gets shot in the back of the head seconds later. During the trial, Gerald Stanley said that, that he had, didn't know the gun was still had bullets and he just went over there to turn it off. But it seems really odd because he, he said he used his left hand to turn it off and the gun was here. And, and so somehow the gun just went off like right in the back of his head. It, it just didn't seem like if you if you try to do it with your body, like reach over a steering column and turn the keys and there's a gun here, how, how could that gun go off just like that in the back of somebody's head? But you know what? That, that's, that was what he gave the jury. He gave them something to give him an out and, and they took it. And we'll never know how that was decided in the jury room because we can't ask the jury. The jury can't say what happened in that jury room. But had there had been one or two indigenous jurors in that jury pool, in, in that room, it might have been a different decision. Because we all know how one indigenous person or two can change the dynamic of a group, can challenge racist views in a room, can raise different points of view. And had that had been the case, it would have at least seemed fair. It would have at least seemed unbiased, but it didn't because it was a room full of white jurors that acquitted Gerald Stanley of that murder. And, and if you look at, and I always talk about the facts when I present because people read what they, what they read in the in media, social media. And unless you were there, unless you read the transcripts, you won't know the true facts. And, and I've stunned mainly non-native audiences when I talk because they, they don't realize what, what the facts were. But if you think about it, it just, it, it's, it doesn't make sense to me. The gun was a, a Tokarev. It was a restricted firearm. Another point about that is is that that firearm you're only supposed to have like use it at a shooting range, really. Like, and he testified that he used it to scare coyotes. That that he used it. He you know that was his gun that he used, and he shot it around his farm. <coughs> And and it it was restricted. That that wasn't really like, there was a lot of gun evidence at the trial, but it was very confusing. Like the the just it was all over the place that gun evidence. It wasn't clear. And then there was um an, a, a witness that they brought in, and he said that you know years ago he experienced a hang fire. I'm just getting over a little bug, so. 
my voice comes and goes. Anyway, um, there were the, the gun evidence in that trial too. It was very confusing, and and then they the crown brought in, or sorry, the defense brought in uh, a witness that said, you know, so I think it was twenty or thirty years ago he experienced a hang fire, and and that evidence was put to put to the jury, and it wasn't made clear that that evidence was not of an expert. And so there were grounds there to appeal it. There were. There were grounds to appeal it. But the Saskatchewan Crown decided not to appeal it. Instead, instead they decided to have a press conference to announce that they weren't going to appeal it. And the day that they... And, and lo the other lawyer... Chris Murphy and I had sent a letter to the Crown and we said, here are the grounds that we think uh, are available to appeal this, so you should appeal it. And, and in, we met with the Minister of Justice. We even met with the Premier of Saskatchewan, Scott Moe, the night after the verdict. That's in the movie. You know, and they, they assured the family, they assured... They assured the leaders of Saskatchewan who were in that room, the First Nation leaders, that they would do everything in their power to make sure that this family obtained justice, that, that they had a fair trial. You know, they sat there and they gave us those assurances and promises. Yet, 30 days later, when it was time to announce the decision whether to appeal or not, they, they phoned at you know, an hour and a half before this press conference, knowing that we're at least three hours away and wouldn't have time to react, to, to go there, to organize our own press conference. Like, it was just, there was such disrespect to the family throughout that whole process, right from day one, right to the time not to appeal. And that's how our people are treated, sadly. Sadly. So you know what? We, we kept going. We kept going. We went to Parliament. We went to uh, the UN. Um, we keep pushing and we keep talking about Colton because we don't want that to happen again. But sadly, that happened in Alberta with the Bilidus, with the Bilidu murderers who killed um, the Métis, the Métis hunters in this province and we said we we want to keep talking about this because we know that this will happen again if these racists and these white supremacists think that they can get away with murder because Gerald Stanley did thankfully in the case here in Alberta there was that video and and that video uh, is is so terrible to watch of the of the shooting but that's the only, th I, th I believe that that's the only reason that those men are convicted is because of that video. Because if you have the, the testimony of Indigenous people and the testimony of non-Indigenous people, unfortunately, usually it's the, it's the white man's version that's going to be more believed because that's just the system that, that we have to work with. I was listening to the Supreme Court of Canada yesterday. One of my colleagues was um, appearing at the Supreme Court for for our, our Indigenous organization in Saskatchewan, FSIN, on on child welfare laws and if if we have the power to make our own child welfare laws. And some of the questions that that the highest court in the land asked were just like it it just. Um, told me that there's so so much I hate the word reconciliation but <laughs> reconciliation to do education teaching the truth the truth about what happened in this country and and my colleague talked about all of the unmarked graves and the bodies that have been found at Indian residential schools I was at a conference last week in Winnipeg where we we're talking about the unmarked graves and the genocide that happened to Indigenous people. Well, it's still happening. It's still happening. This is one case. 
the murders of the four indigenous women by the serial killer in Winnipeg, that's another case. And, and I'm so proud to see indigenous women rising up, calling it genocide and calling for a national, you know, a national state of emergency because we're still being killed. We are. And, and the colonial powers, they don't want to see it. They don't want to recognize it. They don't know what to do because we've always been taken. Uh, the children have been taken. Indigenous people have, have died in the name of colonization for, for land, for resources, for water. You know, it, it is all part of the bigger picture, like Jesse said. And we are the results of colonization, our deaths, our marginalization, our oppression. Um, they, they want what we, what we have, which is we have claims to the land, we have claims to the resources, we have claims to the water. We, we know stuff. <laughs> we know stuff. And that, that stuff that stuff, they will never know. They will never know what we know, ever. Oh, and I don't want to talk about pretend Indians. Cause <laughs> that, that's just another thing that's making me upset these days. <laughs> anyway, back to the PowerPoint. Um, 911 was called. <laughs> this is in the movie. 911 was called. And this is in the trial transcripts, too. Um, they call the Stanley family. So Colton was shot in the back of the head, and then the two girls, they 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 ran, and then Colton's dead, or probably dead at that point. Anyway, the family, the Stanley family, said they they called nine one one, and then they went inside and they had coffee coffee for an hour and a half while they waited for the, the police to show up. What kind of family goes and has coffee? Coffee when there's a, a, a body lying in their driveway. I don't think they were having coffee. Can you, can you go to the next one? Clicker. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So that night, and th we still have a lawsuit about this part here. Um, <clears throat> that night, the RCMP went to Debbie's house, and they uh, they entered her house illegally. They asked her if she was drinking. Uh, they demanded to smell her breath. So they entered her home, and it, well, and they said, "Who like?" This is how Debbie explains it. She says, they, they asked me, who are you to Colton? And she said, uh, that's my son. And they said, uh, like he's deceased or he's dead. And she's, she said, no, no, no. I'm paraphrasing, but, but this is basically what she says. And then, then they said, well, uh, do you know something about a tattoo with Bushy and that he had a tattoo here? And then she says, no, and she falls to the floor crying. And they pick her up and they take her and then into the room, into the living room, and someone smells her breath, asks her if she was drinking, and she wasn't drinking. <coughs> and then she said to them, my son... My son, his, his dinner's in the microwave. I put his dinner in the microwave, and they actually go look. They open the microwave and make sure that his dinner's there. I don't know why they did that. Then they search the entire house, and they, they, they leave. They don't ask her, are you okay? Do you need anything? Do you want us to call somebody? Do you want, you know, victim services? Do you have support? You know, that's not how you deliver a death no notification. You don't run into somebody's house, search it, smell their breath, tell them your son's dead, look in the microwave and take off. Like there was just no regard or respect for her or her family. And her, her grandkids were there. Her sons, her two other sons were there. And then um, yeah, it was it was it was terrible. 
terrible. So there was a complaint made <coughs> to the Complaints Commission and in 2021, uh, that would have been 21, there was a finding that the RCMP discriminated against Debbie that night. And that was after they sat on the report for a whole year, uh, the RCMP, because they, they, I don't, they sat on it for a whole year, a whole year. Anyway, um, I'm all over the place. But I wanted to go back to this press release. So the press release after Colton was shot on August 9th, August 10th, they issued a press release that three of the young people were taken into custody at the scene due to a related theft investigation. And, and that's, I think, probably why they went and searched Debbie's house, because they were looking for something. They were looking for something to explain why Colton was killed. Oh, he must have been stealing. Oh, you know, the, the, there must be stolen property here, or, or maybe one of those, those people who, one of those, uh, his friends who ran off are being hid in his house with stolen stuff. I don't know, but, but that set the tone for the whole case is they were stealing. And, and I still hear that today. We still hear that. Oh, Colton and his friends were stealing. They got what they deserved. Colton got what he deserved because he was, he was a thief. He shouldn't mess with, with white people's things. He shouldn't go to a hardworking farmer's farm and, and steal his stuff. But he wasn't stealing. He wasn't stealing a thing. He was in the back seat sleeping. Moments later, he was shot. The next day, FSIN issued a press release stating that an indigenous man was killed by a non-indigenous farmer. And that's when, when it picked up. Can you click to the next one? This is just more, more background. In the hours after Colton was murdered, uh, the RCMP left the SUV that he was shot and killed in in a downpour, so the SUV was left out in the rain. The door was open. Uh, they could have easily put a tent over it. You know, they could have easily put a tent over the crime scene, but they didn't. They didn't because, because of the systemic racism in the justice system, because of, of their belief that this was a theft-related investigation. It was an open and shut case, probably. If that, if that was <clears throat> the other way around, if it was a white, a young white man shot in an Indian's yard, it would have been way different. There would have been, um, you know, s the whole like helicopters and tents and SWAT teams and they, they would have like had everybody there and, and investigating it fully, but not, no, not this one. Same with those women who were killed in Winnipeg. If those were four white women in a dump, you think they'd be looking for them? Yeah, <laughs> they, would, they would send in the army probably to go search that dump. But no, not when it's four indigenous women. Not when it's a young indigenous man accused of stealing. There was a 24 hour gap between the initial visit to the crime scene and the time a search warrant was granted. Um, during the time, the vehicle was not covered and, and evidence was washed away. Colton, this is, this is what really is terrible, is that Colton was left out in the rain, on the ground, in the rain. Like it, it's just unfathomable to me how they could not at least put something over I think they did put a little tarp over him, but just culturally, that's wrong, that he, he lay out in the rain for all that time. The vehicle was released to a towing company. Um, the RCMP did not bring in a blood spatter expert to the scene. They just they sent the pictures of the SUV and the scene to this blood spatter expert, and that's how she made her opinion. These are just examples of how 
the case was treated, how it was was mishandled, how it wasn't given priority, and that uh, that's why I talk about that. Switch to the next one. <coughs> Gerald Stanley, oh, you were talking about the Sovereignty Act and release and it being approved at one at one a.m. Well, the bill, the bill report, the sorry, the judicial interim release uh, for Gerald Stanley. That was sent out uh, after 5 p.m. on a Friday to the family, to the media. Um, and I know that they pick certain times to release certain things, times when there won't be a lot of attention given to it or when it can, when people can't react, like, like the time to announce the appeal. So we got word that he was released on a Friday after after work hours basically and he was released on ten thousand dollars cash bail uh, there was excessive police presence at the court appearances at the first court appearance that was in um, North Battleford Provincial Court it was the, the F Gerald Stanley's family was escorted around by police and in the courtroom um, the guards stood like this to Gerald Stanley's family. They stood, so they would be back here and the police would was, were standing around them. Like, <laughs> that family was treated so much better than the family of the victim, Colton. And they even took the family of Gerald Stanley to the police detachment for lunch. They took him to the police detachment for lunch. The family of an accused murderer got lunch at the detachment. And I, I asked, I asked the, the officer in charge at the time, I'm like, why? And he's like, well, you know, we just thought it would be better to keep the peace. To keep the peace. I'm like, well, why didn't you take, you know, the, f the family of Colton somewhere for lunch? Why didn't you uh, provide them police protection? And, and after that, then they did have an escort with, with Colton's family for a while, for a while. But at the prelim, which was, you know, months later, uh, there, they had the whole, there was like two or th two blocks probably in North Battleford by the courthouse that were blocked off by barricades and such. And when Gerald Stanley and his family would come to court, there'd be all sorts of police police officers there. But when they left, then the police left, right? So Colton's family would still be there and the, the police would not be there. <laughs> like, it just didn't make any sense. Like it, That's how blatant they were with their racism with their favoritism to this white family like it was it was awful and knowing knowing what I knew being a practicing lawyer and seeing how how like in your face they were with their 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 treatment of Gerald Stanley and his family I knew that it it wasn't looking good right right from the start and I, I kept telling the family, like, you know, we'll we'll fight, we'll speak up, we'll um we'll help you, but you have, you kind of have to be prepared for, for what could happen, what could happen. And I'd always, I don't like being the bearer of bad news, but I'd always tell them like this, this is what could happen, this is how it could go, and it did go that way. But it, it just seemed like, like it was a pattern right from the start, right from the start. The family requested an independent investigator, an outside prosecutor, because we saw how they were being treated, but that, that was not granted. Mm -mm. Thank you. The trial took place January 30th to February 9th, 2018. It was really cold. It was really, really cold during that time, like in the minus 20s. And uh, like I said, it ended up being um, 
a jury of, of, of non-Native people because they use those preemptory challenges. <coughs> but I, I believe as a result of, of the family's advocacy, well, I know as a result of the family's advocacy that preemptory challenges are gone. That is what, like, that's how they, that they use preemptory challenges to get rid of all of the Indigenous jurors in this trial because uh, the way in preemptory challenges work is uh, they can just, they can just say challenge to anybody that, that they don't want to serve in the juror, in the, in the, on the jury. So any juror, they can say challenge and they would get rid of them. Uh, just based on on how they look or you know whatever they they just would get rid of them so as a result of what happened in the bushy in sorry it, with Colton Bushy's family and um, this trial preemptory challenges are are no longer used so that that is one positive thing that came out of this trial during the trial, as I said, Gerald Stanley stated the thing just went off, although the gun was aimed directly at, his, at Colton Bushy's head. <coughs> and self-defense was not, was not put forth as a defense. However, there were terms that were thrown around in the trial that, that alluded to, to that, like a home invasion, uh, your home is your castle, like castle law. Um, it, these terms were used, and it, it it just added to the whole narrative of this hardworking farmer and these indigenous youth who were drinking and stealing, and you know it, it was like they were on pointed, painted to be like on a rampage, and and it was. I just I I seen it and and the jury the jury acquitted him. Um, there was a there was so much evidence about how much those uh, indigenous people in that vehicle drank. Like it, there was so much, and I I know that that's part of a lawyer's job to like attack credibility, but it it was like a lot of focus and the one one part of the trial that was really troubling too was uh, when the defense lawyer showed one of the indigenous victims a s one of the in indigenous males in the vehicle a picture of Colton lying beside the truck like some lying beside the SUV deceased and and that 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 indigenous his friend he just broke down on the stand like he just he just sobbed his heart out because he didn't know that that picture was going to be presented to him and it was just it was so terrible <coughs> can you click thank you this was the jury charge um is the third one if Stanley's actions were reasonable then he should be acquitted can you go to the next one on February 9th 2018 Gerald Stanley was found not guilty he was acquitted on all charges so I want to talk a moment about that moment that moment when he was acquitted we were it was like I think it was about seven in the evening it was early evening <coughs> when we were called back and there was um, Jade Jade Tatusis his sister and then his mom Debbie and Alvin his uncle they were sitting in the front and then I was sitting behind them Gerald Stanley was in the in the uh, prisoner prisoner box or the not the prisoner box the where the accused sits there's a little box there and 
his family was in the front row on this side and then the the judge came in and the jury came in and at the moment they read not guilty it was it was like time stood still and the whole building shook it was it was so unreal and the family they broke down they broke down some of them were stunned some of them were crying there were there were all kinds of um, there's yelling crying and then Gerald Stanley he stood up it was so strange and he yelled I love my wife and then he took off through the back through the chamber like where the judge comes he took off and then his family took off and then the jury took off and then the judge took off and and the family is sitting here in the front row like devastated crying um falling apart but yet these white people felt so threatened that they had to take off like it, it would I don't understand why why they had to do that and then Gerald Stanley this is in the movie too you'll see it he he runs downstairs and he's escorted by sheriffs and they jump in vehicles and they take off and that was like just moments after the verdict but why because the family wasn't mad the family has never called for violence ever and and yet these these people were so scared that they had to flee but that you know that's the whole um narrative about indigenous people and racism towards indigenous people that were that were that were still you know to be feared we're still savage we're unpredictable uh we're violent and and that was how colton was painted and that's how his family was painted in this trial and that's that's exactly what happened uh at the moment of the verdict like it it makes no sense to me but but you know maybe that that's probably how um <coughs> the justice system seen us that that they had to you know keep the peace and prevent any violence towards this family because these these Indians will be mad that this man got away with murder and yeah yeah we were mad but we were not violent we weren't calling for any violence even though there were people who wanted wanted to to do uh, to uprise and and we we never called for that we always said and Debbie always said we have to respond with love we have to respond with kindness and even though we're hurt we got it we we need to speak out because that's how we're going to change things not through being violent it was it was so unreal so we go outside after the verdict Debbie Debbie's upset of course she takes off though just those moments were terrible so terrible but we were standing outside Tasha and I she's filming and this is in the video this is in the movie there were there were pickup trucks circling the courthouse like zoom zoom KKK style going around the courthouse and Tasha started filming them like it was that was a display of white power right there right there they were saying we won we won and and you lose and we're we're more powerful than you we're gonna try to intimidate you and show us show you who we are you know it was that's in the movie like it was it was just so so unreal These are just more injustices. <clears throat> I talked about I talked about some of these, but social media it was so it was so awful towards the family, towards Colton. It still is. It still is. Any indigenous issue where indigenous people are speaking up for themselves, speaking up for their rights, speaking up against racism, you're gonna get the trolls. You're gonna get the white supremacists and and the p and the haters they're all going to come out and start spewing their hatred and and they still do to this day um 
<laughs> this is funny. This is so funny. So they had, after the, the trial, after the acquittal, the RCMP had these little town hall meetings in, the little, in rural towns across Saskatchewan. So there was, there was a core of us. We decided we would, we would crash these meetings. <laughs> so there was one in, I think it was Purdue, that we went to. And this is, this is in the movie, too, this, this town hall meeting. So the RCMP goes, and they, they have this town hall meeting, and, and they're talking about the crime rate. And the crime rate was not bad. It was like, like a couple B&Es and, and, you know, a theft of a vehicle. Like the crime rate was not bad. And in rural Saskatchewan at the time, they're like, oh, there's so much rural crime. You know, we, we're so scared. We're, we, we don't have police response. And the, the, the stats did not back up their fears at all. So... I had court, I think, in Saskatoon that day, so I got to that meeting late. And I was sitting in the back with, with these farmers, white farmers. <coughs> but a little bit of background about myself. I grew up in the 60s scoop, and I was adopted by white farmers. So I knew white farmers. They didn't scare me. So I was sitting in the back with these white farmers. And then the... Um, they started talking about about what happened and rural crime and it started like becoming kind of mobbish and one guy stands up and he's like you know I'll just say it we'd all do what Gerald Stanley did and everybody applauds and then um the other guy the so like it it just turned like that and then there was a uh, a native man, this is in the movie too, he stands up and he's like, you know what, I'm a farmer and I have a farm and if someone came onto my ranch or my farm, you know what I'd do? I'd call the police. <laughs> and, and the reasonable people in the room started clapping for him. So then that kind of broke down the mob mentality. Anyway, so I was sitting in the back with these farmers and they're like, they know I'm sitting there, but they're like, yeah, if anyone came in my yard, you know, just let them. They'd see what I, they would see what I would do to them, and they just started talking, blah, blah, blah. And finally, I just listened, and then I had enough, and I'm like, hey, hey, you know I'm sitting here, right? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, why, why are you talking like that when you see me as an, as an Indigenous woman right here in your space, and you're like, like talking all of the, the threats and, and, and would you really do that? I said, I'll ask you a question. I said, you know, I have children and, and if my daughter, she was, I think, 16 at the time, <clears throat> I said, if she, if she, you know, got lost out here in Purdue or, or ran out of gas or something, if she was around this, these parts and let's say she had a flat tire car trouble, would you, would you shoot her? And they're like, well, no, no, we wouldn't shoot her. We'd help her, of course. Two minutes? Okay. And, um, and they said, well, you know, it's the fear. It's the fear of what might happen. And then, and then we started talking. And then the other indigenous people who were there, Tasha was filming it. It's in the movie. You got, if you see it, you'll, you'll see the dynamic in that room. But that, that's how Indigenous people can change, change a room, change a, a town, change a mob, is by challenging those beliefs. And that's why we pushed for change, changes to the jury. That's why we went to Purdue. At the end of the night, we had, we had these these white people lining up to meet us because they had never met an Indian before. <laughs> like, they were, they invited us back, you know? So, if you challenge racism, if you talk about it, if you ask people the reason why they hold these views, you, you can give them the opportunity to think. <laughs> because when you're taught racism or discrimination or you're taught to be afraid of indigenous people and you haven't had any contact with them or any meaningful conversations or a friendship, you're going to have that racism. And so 
by challenging and speaking up and talking about racism and and like Debbie says <clears throat> being kind even being kind and being talking about and standing up for yourself and your people is being kind you can do that with kindness you can do that with love you can you can stand up for your lands and your waters with kindness you can and that's the whole point of of standing up against systemic racism is you can make a difference and that's why I always talk about Colton because he didn't deserve what he got nor did his family and that's just one example of a family who talks about making change with with love love for yourself for your people for your land so it doesn't happen again and I'm out of time, so thank you. Woo!